you you're not gonna believe this so there's an ama that just came out and i haven't looked at it yet we're gonna look at it in a minute but there's also this tweet that came out from Overwatch Calvary that's from the AMA, and it says an Overwatch 2 series was reportedly in development with Netflix. Jason Schreider suggests the plans changed after Activision Blizzard sued Netflix in 2020 for poaching of its CFO. I gotta read. The, I gotta read this AMA. It's on R slash Wow. And it's I'm Jason Schreider, reporter at Bloomberg and the author of Play Nice: The Rise and Fall and in, f- in Future of Blizzard Entertainment AMA. Hi, I'm Jason Schreider. You may know me as I work at Bloomberg, my podcast Triple Click, or my books Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, and Press Reset. I got a new book coming out on October 8th that's very relevant to the subreddit's interest. It's called Play Nice, The Rise, Fall, and Future Blizzard Entertainment and its Chronicles, the entire 33-year saga of the company behind World of Warcraft, from its humble beginnings as a porting company started by two UCLA students to its transformation into an empire that it's reckoning with a sexual assault or sexual harassment scandal and absorption into Microsoft. The book is based on interviews with more than 350 people, which means it's full of new stories and information that you've never heard before. For example, if you ever wondered why Blizzard was never able to put out WoW expansions more quickly despite promising to do so, and how the, that inability to, uh, became the center of a massive battle between Blizzard and CEO Mike Morham and Activision CEO Bobby Kotick, this book will tell you the whole story. It does come off as like a promotion for his book, but like, I get it. Guy's trying to get his bag, but it also has a lot of stories that people, if, if the they put in the effort for this, like, I, I'm not, I'm not upset with that. Developing stories behind every Blizzard game, including Vanilla Wild WoW Wild Classic. Story, okay, cool. So let's go through some of the questions in, in some of these. What is your biggest shock you learned about the company you didn't expect to hear? Oh my God, there are so many. The fact that Blizzard was briefly owned by a company called Sendant, which was investigated by the SEC for massive fraud and whose CEO eventually went to jail, prosecuted naturally by Chris Christie. There were there were the sex parties. There was the time they got banned from a hotel. There was the Lennon slash McCarthy-esque feud between Chris Metzen and Rob Pardo and so much more. I'm not even going to say it, but like... I know where everyone's brain just went after they read this fucking sentence right here. Dude, what the fuck is with the people in LA and this shit, man? Uh, is it true? A single mountain World of Warcraft earned more money, more money than StarCraft 2. Revenue? No chance. Profit? Maybe. Being made up numbers, if StarCraft 2 cost 10 million to make and brought in revenue of 15... Isn't this like a... Isn't this from like a... a, a Pirate software Thor clip. Uh, revenue of 15 million, while the mount cost 1,000 to make, and it brought in revenue of 5,999,000, then the mount made more profit than StarCraft 2. But I don't know. Though there's all sorts of funky accounting tricks that these companies use to determine stuff like this. The idea of a single mount making more than StarCraft 2 seems like an urban legend, especially given that StarCraft 2 had three different expansions and then went free to play. Isn't isn't this a yeah, it is. Okay. I, I, I knew I wasn't crazy because I've heard that too. Which, by the way, I am I mean, I'm inclined to agree that it's true, uh, especially with the profit, especially. Revenue, I, I see this point. It's like revenue is very different than profit, right? Because like revenue is how much money it made overall, period, before you take into account like costs of labor and you know what I mean? Like make the actual makings of the game while the cost of making a skin is probably much, is so much smaller, right? It's maybe a couple artists and then people who actually code it, test it, make sure it functions in the game and put it out. And the expenses are much lower. So the profit can be much higher. So like, I, I could see both of them end up being potentially true. Hey Jason, uh, are you able to share any details of the string of high profile departures from Team 4 before Overwatch 2 shipped like Jeff Kaplan and Sony Chukow and if it's new leads like Aaron Keller and Jared Nuss have more freedom post acquisition, since I recall you mentioning that Bobby was breathing down their necks a lot during Overwatch One. Also, for a WoW focused question, uh, do you know where the impetus or where the impetus to do a three expansion saga came from? It's a welcome change, IMO, but Blizzard has generally focused on self-contained stories that have some breadcrumbing to the next expansion near the end. Yes. This is covered extensively in the book, but here is the short version. Overwatch 1 was a huge success, and Bobby Kotick was thrilled about it. So thrilled, in fact, that he asked the board of directors to give Mike Morhan a standing ovation during one meeting. 
dude, why is this guy just a fucking supervillain? A standing ovation in a meeting? Like, you, you know, like, you know, like those fucking stories that someone tells, and then there's always that guy in the comments, like, yeah, everyone, and then everyone got up and clapped. He actually, unironically, asked the whole room to get up and clap. But following Overwatch 1's release, Team 4 began to run into a bit of a problem. They had too much work to do. They had it simultaneously, one, keep making new stuff for Overwatch 1, which almost accidentally turned into a live service game. Two, work on Overwatch 2, which was Jeff Kaplan's baby, and would have brought more players into the universe via PvE. Yep, I PV the the whole PvE thing was was Overwatch 2. To this day, some people don't they don't realize that. Like they still argue with it. Overwatch 2 was the PvE. It's not what it is today, but originally that's what it was. Wasn't Overwatch 1 a live service game? Uh no. Actually, it never intended to be a live service game. Overwatch 1 was intended to come out and then have a few updates, release a few characters, and then they were just gonna leave it. But it was such a success that they kind of had to start get the wheels going to turn it into a live service game because there was such a demand for it. But it actually originally was not supposed to get a lot of updates. And then number three, help out with the ever growing Overwatch League. Ever growing my ass. More like ever funded. Connick's solution to this problem. Oh, so actually, sorry, to cover on to talk on that really quick again. Overwatch League actually is another big part of that, right? Because like you have to keep the game moving and, and always updating into like bringing new content and stuff like that. Because like they wanted to turn it into a league. Remember, Overwatch League was being made in 2017. The game came out in 2016, so it had its explosive year 2016, and then they were they never planned to be a long term thing. But then it was such a success that they were like, we should turn this into an esport, and they were going to force the esport thing. And then that was probably around the time where they also decided, oh yeah, we have to just keep releasing content. Like we gotta keep this shit going. So then it turns into a live service game at that point because they're also forcing the eSport. Like there's like a lot of different things I bet. And that's probably also why he also says, here's the short version. And I bet in the book, when it like whenever he releases it, is probably, uh, probably a lot more detailed on that. I, that's at least from what my understanding is. Kodak's solution to this problem was to suggest that Team 4 hire more people. Wait, why am I agreeing with Bobby Kotick? That's not good. Hundreds more people. Like his Call of Duty factory. Okay, that's kind of weird. And start a second team to work on Overwatch 2 while the old team works on Overwatch 1. Wait. What? Or vice versa. Kaplan and Chakao Sunny were resistant to this because they believed pretty strongly in the culture they'd built. More people can sometimes lead to more problems and less efficient development, and it led to all sorts of problems as the years went on. Why am... Dude, why am I agreeing with Bobby? Oh, that's so bad. I I see his point, right? Like, you, with, like... But, but not when you were going to make two. Like, if you had to keep one going and you were going to make two, you need more people. Like, any business understands that. Like, if you grow and you expand... and clock is correct twice a day. Makes a 300 bid. The worst person you know makes a good point. <laughs> Dude, any business knows this. Like, if I own a restaurant, right, and my restaurant's a booming success, and I want to open a second restaurant, I can't just take all the people at my first one and split them in two, and then that's it. Like, you lose half your wait staff, and you lose half your cooks, and your line cooks, and your uh, people working your books, and all this other stuff. Like, dude. Like some, like maybe the the bit, like the management side, like accounting and stuff like that, they could probably do do too. Be a little bit more work, yeah. But like, you can't have half the wait staff. You can't have half the chefs. The food's gonna take longer. It's gonna be longer lines. It's gonna be a piece of shit. Like you need to bring in more people once you go to the second one, right? Oh no, that is that's real bad. Especially if Jeff was obviously set on making Overwatch Two, because it sounds like Overwatch Two was Jeff's idea because he wanted to make the PV game. Which is fine. I, I think that could have been amazing. There's no world where they could have kept Overwatch 1 afloat and worked on Overwatch 2. We, we were there. It didn't happen. It didn't work. That's kind of sad. I hate that, that the worst person I know just made a good point. I actually kind of agree that they should have done that, probably. Uh, loved Blood, Sweat, and Pixels. Plus, or sorry, plus press reset. I in evangel got dude, brain evangelicalize those books to everyone. Got my physical pre-order for Play Nice ready to go. Is the Final Fantasy Tactics slash Remaster Remake Dream still alive? FTT or FFT Remaster is real. I just have no idea when it's coming. 
hopefully next year, to pair with the Lunar and Sikoden remasters for the ultimate PS1 nostalgia trip. I don't know anything about Final Fantasy Tactics, but okay, cool, guess there's a remake for that. Was it difficult to get people to talk about their experiences at Blizzard? Any particular subject that was easier or harder to get people to talk about? Also, how willing were the people at Activision side to talk for the book? I would say the more recent the event, the harder it was to get people to talk on record. Which makes sense if you think about it. Nobody real, Nobody's really worried about someone going after them because they spilled the beans on what it was like in Silicon Synapse in 1991. And yeah, I spoke to a bunch of Activision folks, although most were off the record. Same sort of trend applies. That makes sense. I mean, real talk. The world is a lot smaller than you think, and especially in a warm world like gaming. If you, okay, my advice to my my younger people, my my people that are maybe not in college or college age or going to college soon or younger, the world fucking sucks, man. It blows. And if you're somebody that doesn't get straight A's, that's okay. Because in this world, many times, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And there's a lot of companies and a lot of people that would rather work with the guy who's just the fun dude to be around. He's a fun dude. You know, he's not the best, but he gets he gets his work done passably. Um, but he's just nice, sociable dude, friends with a lot of people. You know, everyone looks at him as a good dude. Then the really fucking smart, but uptight kind of annoying dude. And the reason for that is just compatibility. And the reason why in, I'm saying that that's relevant here is because even in gaming, in that space a lot of devs know each other they know of each other and so word can travel fast and so you don't want to be get on the bad side of somebody else or be heard of or being known as talking shit about some other developer or some higher up in another company because you might not get hired somewhere else so i kind of understand why they don't want to go on the record and say that because nobody wants to be outed as someone who like snitched on someone else on another side or whatever it might be so i kind of get that i can't even i can't even blame anyone for not wanting to go on record for that, because I wouldn't either. Uh, are you aware of any internal reluctance to internally put out WoW Classic, or did much of the workforce want to release it? But where was held back a lack of interest, oh, sorry, but where held back by a lack of interest from executive? Folks like J. Allen Brack seemed quite dismissive about the desires to release it originally. I remember that. They said that, uh, what was it? I quote something like, Gamers think they want this game, but they actually don't. Yeah, they meant were. They typed where. Yeah, it tripped me up a little bit. Uh, despite there being a fair bit of interest, IMO, those various fans and content creators. It's always a question of resources, right? If X people are working on WoW Classic, that means they can't work on anything else. But I haven't heard anything about a ton of reluctance from Brack to greenlight the project, despite his infamous comments at BlizzCon that one year. Yep, that's the one I was just talking about. I think as... Uh, Nostalarius really took off. They had a lot of conversations internally about what WoW Classic would be like. A guy named Oscar, or sorry, Omar Gonzalez, built a prototype. They brought in lead engineer Brian Birmingham to helm the project, and it was just a small team working on it for a few years to try and figure out the best way to handle the technical challenges that came with it. Okay, you know, it's kind of cool. You know what's kind of cool is... He probably said that and he might have actually thought that way and then the public responded like holy f you're kind of an idiot like don't like that's stupid and then might have actually changed his stance internally and was like no nah, i'm actually not against it okay if you want that we'll do it can we address the fact that recent was r slash mercy mains you know what this is you know what i remember what this is remember during the pink mercy thing this is the last time i've used reddit reddit it was pink mercy remember the the whole pink mercy thing and there was a whole subreddit that had all the stuff, like all the info on how they got it early. You guys were there. There's literally a video of it, but okay. As it seems quite related to your book, which I pre-ordered, patch 9.1.5 was released shortly after Blizzard's sexual harassment scandals came to light. Featured a wide assortment of sudden changes. Multiple voice slash jokes slash flirt lines were removed. In-game artwork that was vaguely sexual and, dis and dis deception was edited. The infamous painting of a woman laid on her side into a bowl of fruit painting, along with various other strings of dialogue changed throughout the game. Was this a knee-jerk reaction from Blizzard higher-ups, desperate to ensure that nothing within the game could be used against them? Or did this reflect elements of the game that the WoW dev team had been uncomfortable with for some time and finally had the autonomy to alter these? WoW, I had no idea, is the response. 
I'll ask a couple of folks about this if I get a chance, but knowing I had knowing what I know about how Blizzard functions, I assume those decisions were made on a team two level, not a Blizzard sweet C suite level. Executive producers, Woo. and after a recent reorg, GMs and will have a lot of power in the company to make calls about their games and their team's resources. Wait, there's actually something interesting in there. After a recent reorg, GMs have a lot of power in the company to make calls about their games and their team's resources. I wonder if that's true for all of them. So I read this. My question is, what would be the sense you, you got about us players or how your players are viewed internally at Blizzard? Uh, like you did get a read from anyone that has such a passionate player base, both valid and invalid in our complaints from time to time, is viewed and managed internally at the company. Uh, I mean, Blizzard's whole ethos to be a player first, and I do take that seriously uh, from what I've heard Sorry, and they do take that seriously. That's good. Uh, from what I've heard, folks use BlizzCon every year as fuel to get them through hard times. It was so exhilarating to see BlizzCon, or sorry, Blizzard fan reactions to all their game announcements and community events. That said, there are also a few stories in the book about players having a negative impact on Blizzard, such as a chapter about the development of Diablo 3. I spoke to director Jay Wilson about how the harassment affected his life. It's an ugly, ugly story. That's actually really sad. I've said this so many times. I get every time I say this, like I call the fucking shill, and it's like, dude, you guys don't know what a shill is, you dumb. Um, but anyways, like you can tell, I've met so many people at Blizzard, at least on the Overwatch side, and a lot of them really do care. Like the actual dev team, like the people who work on the game, genuinely give so much of a shit. It hurts, I think, them to see when people say, like, nah, you guys suck, you don't actually care. And it's like, how do you think they don't care? Like, yeah, not every decision you can agree with. Yeah, they can fuck up. Yeah, other shits gets in the way. But it's like, overall, they do care. There, But there are still serious issues. And that, that doesn't mean you should disregard those serious issues. But then also people take it so far and then harass individual devs. And you know what, though? There's even people in Overwatch that do that. And that shit is not acceptable. And harassing individual devs, like, you can criticize the work, but once you go after the person, like, you've crossed so many lines. Like, you are literally an asshole for that. And it's like, they don't deserve that, dude. Like, they work on a f***ing video game. Like, they well, they work on a f***ing video game. Like, they're not taking your damn rights away. Like, if you want to get mad at people that do that, you should do that. Like, I feel like if there's any place to go f***ing do that for, that's a place you should go go crazy for. But it's like, dude... I always, my heart always breaks a little bit when I hear about stories for with people like this, because what, what the f*** did his wife and kids do, or his family do, you know what I mean? They didn't do shit. Like, they don't deserve to be harassed, and their family doesn't deserve to be harassed. Oh, yeah, like, in Overwatch, we had it with, um, Briggs' voice actor. Briggs' voice actor, when Brig was destroying the game, um, in Overwatch 1, when she was just running rampant, everyone, people went after the, her voice actor. Like, people were like, the voice actor is responsible. Like, how motherfucking stupid are you? Like, how actually dumb do you have to be to genuinely believe that? I've been playing since the Wrath days around the time Activision Blizzard murder, merger that took place in 2008 and 2010, they released first Storm Mount, the Celestial Steed. This feels like it was a watershed moment because it feels like the Celestial Steed was something Blizzard would not have done, but was something Activision's influence caused them to do. And it seemed to be followed by many other corner cuts, arguably, cult, arguably cultivating in Warlords of Draenor, which famously cut so many features from what was promised while selling basically any unique mounts in the shop. I guess it was it basically not selling any unique mounts in the shop is what, what they meant. Uh, do you have any insight on that period of time or when, how the influence of Activision began to, to overtake classic Blizzard sensibles? Uh, this is a great question. As far as I know, the answer is no, it was Blizzard, not Activision. To put things in context a little bit, in 2009 and 2010 was an interesting time for Blizzard. World of Warcraft was firing on all cylinders and growing every year, but their other projects weren't quite as successful. StarCraft II had a slip or had a slip a year because the new battle net was not ready, while Diablo 3 had gone through multiple reboots and Blizzard's North's collapse and was still yet or it was still years away. And Blizzard's North's collapse and was still years away. Oh, the reboots. Sorry, I, I didn't I lost it for a sec. People are still jazzed about Titan, but we all we know is, we all know how that one went. Okay. Uh, but server costs were high and the company was growing more and more every year. So Mike Morham started to push all of the teams to include some sort of in-game monetization. WoW had cosmetics, StarCraft II has a customizable map marketplace, 
and Diablo 3 would have had the auction house. Fun fact, one of the reasons Diablo 3 never got a second expansion was because after removing the auction house, it no longer had a source of recurring vet revenue. So Blizzard decided to move straight to D4 rather than to make any new content for it. The merger undoubtedly came with new pressures uh, because now rather than just being a small part of Vendi, Blizzard was now one of the two names in the title of a publicly traded company and I'm sure that had to come with an impact on Morhane's decision making. But this push for in-game revenue did not, as I know, come from Activision or Kodak. The pressures from Activision really started in 2013 after Titan was cancelled and trickled all the way down to the entirety of the company around 2017-2018. Wow. And that's when our problems started. <laughs> Damn, dude. Uh, I think the rest of these are probably more WoW than Overwatch. Oh, here's one. In your book, part where one of the executives was disappointed on how Overwatch 1 was not charging for maps and characters, will your book discuss how Overwatch 2 came as a result from all the executive meddling? Yes, I think when you read the book, you'll have a very clear idea of what happened with Overwatch 2 and why it feels so much like a Overwatch 1.5. Interesting. I don't think there's really anything else in here though, right? I think we got the, the most important ones that are... Okay, you know what though? Yeah, obviously he's pushing for reading a book, uh, which I get it and buying a book. I, I get it. He wants to, you know, he wants to sell copies. That's totally fine. That being said, though, I want to know where the Netflix article won, though. Did we go over that already? Where was the Netflix article? Any insight into why Blizzard hasn't branched into movie slash TV slash animation? Yeah, the 2016 Warcraft film happened, but it seems strange how in the 20 plus years of WoW and even longer of Blizzard's story, heavy IPs or Blizzard's, uh, the history of, sorry, history of Blizzard's heavy story IPs. They've been increasingly light uh, on expanding from games, WoW books, short live comic series, etc. Are they even trying at all? The book reveals that they had series in development with Netflix for Warcraft, Overwatch, and Diablo. But, uh, and then it's a link to them getting sued. Netflix sued again for poaching, this time by Activision Blizzard. Holy shit. I didn't see this one in the, I was scrolling through here. I mean, it's the whole reason I came here was for that one. But holy shit, the fact that we could have had an Overwatch Netflix series and it got canceled and ruined over a poaching of a CFO and so they sued him. Dude, that's crazy. So that pretty much means that there'll never be a Netflix series, right? Pretty much. Hi Jason, I love the chapter you wrote on Press Re Reset on the 38 Studios, the Kurt Schilling debacle. I saw a tweet from you a few months ago about Kurt Schilling going full on at some point in the last few years. Have you heard of other people in companies that research your books similarly on the strange afterlives? Looking forward to the book. If you told me in 2017 when I published Blood, Sweat, and Pixels in the 2014, and that in 2014 Eric Byron would still be working on Stardew Valley, well I probably wouldn't have been surprised, but it's still a pretty wild thought. Um, I actually have met Kurt Schilling's daughter when I was in early college, late high school. I have never met someone that made me so uncomfortable in my entire life. Like when I tell you the definition of my, I, do you know who my dad is? I'll just say this. There was one time that I was at somebody's house and they were having a party. Like a, they were drinking, like, you know, pool party, a lot of people there. And she showed up and got absolutely hammered wanted to go home and everyone's like you can't leave, just drive home you can't do that and she like literally went fucking bananas and was like literally screaming like you don't know who like who i am like you're all poor like compared to me all this shit and then literally got in her mercedes and drove home absolutely shit faced and then wanted to come back again and it was like i i i have it was Truly, like she she thought she had the right to anyone at that. Like I remember, she like literally like grabbed one of my friends by the hand, like literally trying to like drag him in the house, and he was like, he was like, I'm fucking good, like I'm all set, like <laughs> it was. Oh man. So, am I that surprised by this? Not really. Hi, Jason. Loving thread and reply so far. What was the most surprising interaction you had ever had with Blizzard executives? Were there any higher ups? For you that really stood out with their behavior either positive or negative nothing comes to mind for blizzard 
But once at an E3, I was in a hotel elevator and saw someone who was at the time higher up at Bungie, no longer there. And he was like, oh, you're staying here too? And then kind of turned his back to me. Then he blocked me on Twitter. I still don't know what I did to him. <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny, but that's just so funny. Like, oh, you're here? And then like turning around, like facing the other way, like in real life, it's like, what? Farted in the elevator, maybe? Dude, I feel like if I had one ready to go, I'm ripping it at that point. Real talk. Anyways, though. Damn. We really, we actually really could have had a Netflix series. That's tough.